Section 14 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6C, Subsection A. The Moral View of the World. Self-consciousness knows and accepts duty as the absolute. It is bound by that alone, and this substance is its own conscious life pure and simple. Duty cannot, for it, take on the form of something alien and external. When thus shut up and confined within itself, however, moral self-consciousness is not yet affirmed and looked at as consciousness. The object is immediate knowledge, and, being thus permeated purely by the self, is not object. But this knowledge being essentially mediation and negativity, there is implied in its very conception relation to some otherness and thus it is consciousness this other because duty constitutes its sole essential purpose and objective content is a reality completely devoid of significance for consciousness but again because this consciousness is so entirely confined within itself it takes up towards this otherness a perfectly free and detached attitude and the existence of this other is therefore an existence completely set free from self-consciousness and in like manner relating itself merely to itself the freer self-consciousness becomes the freer also is the negative object of its consciousness the object is thus a complete world within itself with an individuality of its own an independent whole of laws peculiar to itself as well as an independent procedure and an unfettered active realization of those laws it is altogether a nature a nature whose laws and also whose action belong to itself as a being which is not disturbed about the moral self-consciousness just as the latter is not troubled about it starting with the specific character of this sort there is formed and established a moral outlook or point of view which consists in a process of relating the implicit aspect of morality moralisches ansichtsein and the explicit aspect moralisches fürsichsein this relation presupposes both thorough reciprocal indifference and specific independence as between nature and moral purposes and activity and also on the other side a conscious sense of duty as the sole essential fact and of nature as entirely devoid of independence and essential significance of its own the point of view or attitude of the moral life consists in the development of these moments which are involved in the relation of such entirely antithetic and contradictory presuppositions to begin with then the moral consciousness in general is presupposed it takes duty to be the essential reality itself is actual and active and in its actuality and action fulfils duty but this moral consciousness at the same time finds before it the assumed freedom of nature it learns by experience that nature is not concerned about giving consciousness a sense of the unity of its reality with that of nature and hence discovers that nature may let it become happy but perhaps also may not the non-moral consciousness on the other hand finds by chance perhaps its realization where the moral consciousness sees merely an occasion for acting but does not see itself enjoying through its action the success of performance and the satisfaction of achievement it therefore finds reason for bewailing a situation where there is no correspondence between itself and existence and lamenting the injustice which confines it to having its object merely in the form of pure duty but refuses to let it see this object and itself actually realized the moral consciousness cannot renounce happiness and drop this element out of its absolute purpose the purpose which is expressed as duty pure and simple essentially implies retention of individual self-consciousness and maintenance of its claims individual conviction and knowledge thereof constituted a fundamental element in morality this element in the objectified purpose in duty fulfilled is the particular consciousness seeing itself as actually realized in other words this moment is that of enjoyment which thus lies in the very principle of morality not indeed of morality in the sense of immediate feeling and sentiment but in the principle of the actualization of morality owing to this however enjoyment is also involved in moral sentiment 
for morality seeks not to remain sentiment as opposed to action but to act or realize itself thus the purpose expressed as a whole along with the consciousness of its elements or moments is that duty fulfilled shall be both a purely moral act and a realized individuality and that nature the aspect of particularity in contrast with abstract purpose shall be one with this purpose while experience must necessarily bring to light the disharmony between the two aspects saying that nature is detached and apart nevertheless duty is alone the essential fact and nature by contrast is devoid of selfhood that purpose in its entirety which the harmony of the two constitutes contains within it actuality itself it is at the same time the thought of actuality the harmony of morality and nature or seeing that nature is taken account of merely so far as consciousness finds out nature's unity with it the harmony of morality and happiness is thought of as necessarily existing it is postulated for to postulate or demand means that something is thought to be which is not yet actual a necessity affecting not a conception qua conception but existence but the requirement or necessity is at the same time essentially a relation through the conception the existence demanded thus belongs not to something present in the mind of some chance individual consciousness but is implied in the very notion of morality itself whose true content is the unity of pure with individual consciousness it falls to the individual consciousness to see that this unity is for it an actuality happiness as regards the content of the purpose and existence in general as regards its form the existence thus demanded the unity of both is therefore not a wish nor looked at qua purpose is it of such a kind as to be still uncertain of attainment the purpose is rather a demand of reason or an immediate certainty and presupposition of reason the first experience above referred to and this postulate are not the only experience and postulate a whole round of postulate comes to light for nature is not merely this completely detached external mode in which as a bare pure object consciousness has to realize its purpose consciousness is per se essentially something for which this other detached reality exists that is it is itself something contingent and natural this nature which is properly its own is sensibility which taking the form of volition in the shape of impulses and inclinations has by itself a determinate essential being of its own that is has specific particular purposes and thus is opposed to abstract will with its pure purpose in contrast with this opposition however pure consciousness rather takes the relation of sensibility to it the absolute unity of sensibility with it to be the essential fact both of these pure thought and sensibility are essentially and inherently one consciousness and pure thought is just that for which and in which this pure unity exists but for it qua consciousness the opposition between itself and its impulses holds in this conflict between reason and sensibility the essential thing for reason is that the conflict should be resolved and that the unity of both should come out as a result not the original unity which consisted in both the opposites being in one individual but a unity which arises out of the known opposition of the two so attained such a unity is then the actual morality for in it is contained the opposition through which the self is a consciousness or first becomes concrete and in actual fact self and at the same time universal in other words we find there expressed that process of mediation which as we see is essential to morality since of the two factors in opposition sensibility is otherness out and out is the negative while on the other hand pure thought of duty is the ultimate essence which cannot possibly be surrendered in any respect it seems as if the unity produced can be brought about only by doing away with sensibility but since sensibility is itself a moment of this process of producing the unity is the aspect of actuality we have in the first instance to be content to express the unity in this form sensibility should be in conformity with morality this unity is likewise a postulated existence it is not there as a fact 
for what is there is consciousness or the opposition of sensibility and pure consciousness all the same the unity is not a something per se like the first postulate in which free external nature constitutes an aspect and the harmony of nature with moral consciousness in consequence falls outside the latter rather nature is here that which lies within consciousness and we have here to deal with morality moralität as such with a harmony which is the active self's very own consciousness has therefore of itself to bring about this harmonious unity and to be always making progress in morality the completion of this result however is pushed away into the remote infinite because if it actually entered the life of consciousness as an actual fact the moral consciousness would be done away with for morality is only moral consciousness qua negative force sensibility has merely a negative significance for the consciousness of pure duty it is something merely not in conformity with duty by attaining that harmony however morality qua consciousness that is its actuality passes away just as in the moral consciousness or actuality its harmony vanishes the completion is therefore not to be reached as an actual fact it is to be thought of merely as an absolute task or problem that is one which remains a problem pure and simple nevertheless its content has to be thought as something which unquestionably has to be and must not remain a problem whether we imagine the moral consciousness quite cancelled in the attainment of this goal or not which of these exactly is the case cannot very well be clearly distinguished in the dim distance of infinitude to which the attainment of the end has to be postponed just because we cannot decide the point we shall be strictly speaking bound to say that a definite idea on the matter ought to be of no interest and ought not to be sought for because this leads to contradictions the contradiction in speaking of an undertaking that at once ought to remain an undertaking and yet ought to be carried out and the contradiction in speaking of a morality which is not consciousness that is which is no longer actual by adopting the view however that morality when completed would contain a contradiction the sacredness of moral truth would be seriously affected and an unconditional duty would appear something unreal the first postulate was the harmony of morality and objective nature the final purpose of the world the other was the harmony of morality and will in its sensuous form in the form of impulse etc the final purpose of self-consciousness as such the former is the harmony in the form of implicit immanent existence the latter the harmony in the form of explicit self-existence that however which connects these two extreme final purposes which are thought and operates as their mediating ground is the process of concrete action itself they are harmonies whose moments in their abstract distinctiveness from each other have not yet become definitely objective this takes place in concrete actuality in which the aspect appears in consciousness proper each as the other of the other the postulates arising by this means contain harmonies which are now completely realized and objective whereas formerly they were merely separated into implicit and explicit immanent and self-existent the moral consciousness qua barren simple knowledge and willing of pure duty is brought by the process of acting upon an object opposed to that abstract simplicity into relation with the manifold actuality which various cases present and thereby assumes a moral attitude varied and manifold in character hence arise on the side of content the plurality of laws generally and on the side of form the contradictory powers of intelligent knowing consciousness and of a being devoid of consciousness to begin with as regards the plurality of duties it is merely the aspect of pure or bare duty in them which in general appeals to the moral consciousness as being of significance the many duties qua many are determinate and therefore are not as such anything sacred for the moral consciousness at the same time however being necessary in virtue of the very nature of action which implicates a manifold actuality and hence manifold types of moral attitude those many duties must be looked on as having a substantial existence and value furthermore since they can only exist in a moral consciousness they exist at the same time in another consciousness than that for which only pure duty qua bare duty is sacred and self-sufficient 
it is thus postulated that there is another consciousness which renders them sacred or which knows them as duties and wills them so the first maintains pure duty indifferent towards all specific content and duty consists merely in being thus indifferent towards it the other however contains the equally essential relation to the process of action and the necessity therefore of determinate content since duties for this other mean determinate duties the content is thus for it just as essential as the form in virtue of which the content is a duty at all this consciousness is consequently such that in it the universal and the particular are through and through one its essential principle is thus the same as that of the harmony of morality and happiness for this opposition between morality and happiness expresses in like manner the separation of the self-identical moral consciousness from that actuality which qua manifold existence opposes and conflicts with the simple nature of duty while however the first postulate expresses merely the objective existential harmony between morality and nature because nature is therein the negative of self-consciousness is the aspect of existence this inherent harmony on the other hand is now affirmed essentially as a mode of consciousness for existence now appears as the content of duty as that in the determinate duty which gives it specific determinateness the immanent harmony is thus the unity of elements which qua simple ultimate elements are essentially thought created and hence cannot exist except in a consciousness this latter becomes now a master and ruler of the world who brings about the harmony of morality and happiness and at the same time sanctifies duties in their multiplicity to sanctify these duties means this much that the consciousness of pure duty cannot straightway and directly accept the determinate or specific duty as sacred but because a specific duty owing to the nature of concrete action which is something specific and definite is all the same necessary its necessity falls outside that consciousness and holds inside another consciousness which thus mediates or connects determinate and pure duty and is the reason why that specific duty also has validity in the concrete act however consciousness proceeds to work as this particular self as completely individual it directs its activity on actual reality as such and takes this as its purpose for it wants to perform something definite duty in general thus falls outside it and within another being which is the consciousness and sacred lawgiver of pure duty the consciousness which acts just because it acts accepts the other consciousness that of bare duty and admits its validity immediately this pure duty is thus a content of another consciousness and is only indirectly or in immediate way sacred for the active consciousness that is in virtue of this other consciousness because it is established in this manner that the validity the bindingness of duty as something holy and absolutely sacred falls outside the actual consciousness this latter thereby stands altogether on one side as the incomplete moral consciousness just as in regard to its knowledge it is aware of itself as that whose knowledge and conviction are incomplete and contingent in the same way as regards its willing it feels itself to be that whose purposes are affected with sensibility on account of its unworthiness therefore it cannot look on happiness as something necessary but as a something contingent and can only expect happiness as the result of grace but though its actuality is incomplete duty is still so far as its pure will and knowledge are concerned held to be the essential truth in principle therefore so far as the notion is opposed to actual reality in other words in thought it is perfect the absolute truth duty is however just this object of thought and is something postulated beyond the actual it is therefore the thought in which the morally imperfect knowledge and will are held to be perfect and since it takes this imperfection to have full weight in which consequently happiness is meted out according to worthiness that is according to the merit ascribed this completes the meaning of the moral attitude for in the conception of moral self-consciousness the two aspects pure duty and actual reality are affirmed of a single unity and thereby the one like the other is put forward not as something self-complete but as a moment 
or as cancelled and transcended this becomes consciously explicit in the last phase of the moral attitude or point of view consciousness we there saw places pure duty in another form of being than its own consciousness that is it regards pure duty partly as something ideally presented partly as what does not by itself hold good indeed the non-moral is rather what is held to be perfect in the same way it affirms itself to be that whose actuality not being in conformity with duty is transcended and qua transcended or in the presented idea of what is absolute pure duty no longer contradicts morality for the moral consciousness itself however its moral attitude does not mean that consciousness therein develops its own proper notion and makes this its object it has no consciousness of this opposition either as regards the form or the content thereof the elements composing this opposition it does not relate and compare with one another but goes forward on its own course of development without being the connecting principle of those moments for it is only aware of the essence pure and simple that is the object so far as this is duty so far as this is an abstract object of its pure consciousness qua pure knowledge in other words it is only aware of this object as itself its procedure is thus merely that of thinking not conceiving is by way of thoughts not notions consequently it does not yet find the object of its actual consciousness transparently clear to itself it is not the absolute notion which alone grasps otherness as such its absolute opposite as its very self its own reality as well as all objective reality no doubt is held to be something unessential but its freedom is that of pure thought in opposition to which therefore nature has likewise arisen as something equally free because both are found in like manner within it both the freedom which belongs to external being and the inclusion of this existence within consciousness its object comes to be an existing object which is at the same time merely a thought product in the last phase of its attitude or point of view the content is essentially so constituted that its being has the character of something presented an idea and this union of being and thinking is expressed as what in fact it is that is presentation when we look at the moral view of the world in such a way that this objective result is nothing else than the very principle or notion of moral self-consciousness which it makes objective to itself there arises through this consciousness concerning the form of its origin another mode of exhibiting this view of the world the first stage which forms the starting point is the actual moral self-consciousness or is the fact that there is such a self-consciousness at all for the notion establishes moral self-consciousness in the form that for it all reality in general has essential being only so far as such reality is in conformity with duty and that notion establishes this essential element as knowledge that is in immediate unity with the actual self this unity is thus itself actual is a moral actual consciousness the latter now qua consciousness presents its content to itself as an object that is as the final purpose of the world as the harmony of morality with all reality since however it represents this unity as object and is not yet a complete notion which has the object as such in its grasp this unity is taken to be something negative of or opposed to self-consciousness that is the unity falls outside it as something beyond its actual reality but at the same time of such a nature as to be also existent though merely thought of this self-consciousness which qua self-consciousness is something other than the object thus finds itself left with the want of harmony between the consciousness of duty and actual reality a reality too which is its own the proposition consequently now runs thus there is no morally complete actual self-consciousness and since what is moral only is in the long run so far as it is complete for duty is the pure unadulterated ultimate element an sich, and morality consists merely in conformity to this pure principle the second proposition runs there is no morally actual existence at all since however in the third place it is a self it is inherently the unity of duty and of actual reality this unity thus becomes its object as completed morality 
but as something beyond its actual reality and yet a beyond which still ought to be real in this final stage and last expression of the synthetic unity of the two first propositions the self-conscious reality as well as duty is only affirmed as a transcended or superseded moment for neither of them is alone neither is isolated on the contrary these factors whose essential characteristic lies in being free from one another are thus each in that unity no longer free from the other each is transcended hence as regards content they become as such object each of them holds good for the other and as regards form they become such that this interchange on their part is at the same time merely in idea is merely ideally presented or again the actually non-moral because it is at the same time pure thought and elevated above its own actual reality is in idea still moral and is taken to be entirely sufficing in this way the first proposition that there is a moral self-consciousness is reinstated but bound up with the second that there is none that is to say there is one but merely in idea in other words there is indeed none but it is all the same allowed by some other consciousness to pass for one End of section 14section fifteen of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six c subsection b dissemblance translator's note the first stage fails as it stands to do complete justice to the full meaning of morality both elements in the spiritually complete individual are essential and each has to be recognized the universal must be objectified in nature external nature and sensibility and nature must be subjectivized in spirit another condition or stage of the moral consciousness therefore is found where the equality of value of the elements of the moral consciousness is admitted without these elements being completely fused into a single and total attitude the universal is realized in many ways and forms and each is accepted in turn as the true moral reality the mind passes from one to the other when one is accepted the other is set aside the moral consciousness tries so to say to hide from itself the endless diversity of its appearances simply because it clings tenaciously to the idea that the inherent self-completeness of itself is a unity per se which can only admit diversity on sufferance formerly it eliminated all diversity by eliminating the source of diversity nature here it is forced to admit diversity and yet cannot give up the claim to be an abstract single unity independent of difference thus its condition here is a mixture of self-realization and self-sophistication a condition which hegel characterizes as dissemblance and which borders upon and may pass into hypocrisy hegel regards this attitude as the inevitable outcome of the proceeding end of translator's note dissemblance in the moral attitude of experience we see on one side consciousness itself produce its object in a conscious way we find that neither does it pick up the object as something external nor does the object come before it in an unconscious manner rather consciousness throughout proceeds on a certain basis and from this establishes the objective reality it thus knows this objective element to be itself for it is aware of itself as the active agent producing this object it seems in consequence to attain here its peace and satisfaction for this can only be found where it does not need to go any more beyond its object because this object no longer goes beyond it on the other side however it really puts the object away outside itself as something beyond itself but this latter self-contained entity is at the same time put there as something that is not detached from self-consciousness but really there on behalf of and by means of it the moral attitude is therefore in fact nothing else than a developed expression of this fundamental contradiction in its various aspects it is to use a kantian phrase which is here most appropriate a perfect nest of inconsistencies and contradictions 
consciousness in developing this situation proceeds by fixing definitely one moment passing thence immediately over to another and doing away with the first but in the way it has now set up this second moment it also shifts verstellt this again and really makes the opposite the essential element at the same time it is conscious of its contradiction and of this displacement for it passes from one moment immediately in its relation to this very moment right over to the opposite because a moment has for it no reality at all it affirms that very moment as real or what comes to the same thing in order to assert one moment as per se existent it asserts the opposite as the per se existent it thereby confesses that as a matter of fact it is an earnest about neither of them the various moments of this fraudulent process we must look at more closely let us allow the assumption that there is an actual moral consciousness to rest on its own basis in the first instance because the assumption is not directly made with reference to something preceding and let us turn to the harmony of morality and nature the first postulate it is to be immanent not explicitly for actual conscious life not really present the present is rather simply the contradiction between the two in the present morality is taken to be something at hand and actual reality to be so situated or placed that it is not in harmony with morality the concrete moral consciousness however is active consists in acting that is what constitutes the actuality of its morality in the very process of acting however that place or semblance is immediately displaced is dissembled for action is nothing else than the actualization of the inner moral purpose nothing but the production of an actuality constituted and determined by purpose in other words the production of the harmony of moral purpose and reality itself at the same time the performance of the action is a conscious fact it is the presence of this unity of reality and purpose and because in the completed act consciousness realizes itself as a given particular consciousness or sees existence return into itself qua particular and in this consists the nature of enjoyment there is eo ipso also contained in the realization of moral purpose that form of its realization which is called enjoyment and happiness action thus as a fact fulfils directly what it was asserted could not take place at all fulfils what was to be merely a postulate was to lie merely beyond consciousness therefore expresses through its deed that it is not in earnest in making the postulate since the meaning of acting is really that it makes a present fact of what was not to be in the present and since the harmony is postulated for the sake of the action for what is to become actual through action must be implicit otherwise the actuality would not be possible the connection of action with the postulate is so constituted that for the sake of action that is for the sake of the actual harmony of purpose and reality this harmony is put forward as not actual as far away as beyond since action does take place the want of adaptation between purpose and reality is thus in general not taken seriously action itself on the other hand does seem to be taken seriously but as a matter of fact the actual deed done is the action of a particular consciousness and so is itself merely something particular and the result contingent the end of reason however being the all-comprehensive universal end is nothing short of the entire world a final purpose which goes far beyond the content of this particular act and therefore is to be placed altogether above anything actually done because the universal best ought to be carried out nothing good is done in point of fact however the nothingness of actual action and the reality of the entire purpose alone which are here upheld these are on all hands again shifted or dissembled the moral act is not something contingent and restricted its essential nature lies in pure duty this pure duty constitutes the sole entire purpose and the act whatever may be the limitation of the content being the actualization of that purpose is the accomplishment of the entire absolute purpose or if again we take the reality in the sense of nature which has laws of its own and stands over against pure duty and take it in such a way that duty cannot realize its law within nature then since duty as such is the essential element 
we are when acting not in fact concerned about the accomplishment of pure duty which is the whole purpose for the accomplishment would then rather have as its end not pure duty but the opposite that is reality but there is again a shifting from the position that it is not reality with which we have to do for by the very notion of moral action pure duty is essentially an active consciousness action thus ought certainly to take place absolute duty ought to be expressed in the whole of nature and moral law to become natural law if then we allow this highest good to stand for the essentially real consciousness is not altogether in earnest with morality for in this highest good nature has not a different law from what morality has moral action itself in consequence drops for action takes place only under the assumption of a negative or opposing element which is to be cancelled by means of the act but if nature conforms to the moral law then undoubtedly this moral law would be violated by acting by cancelling what already exists on that mode of interpretation then there has arisen as the essential situation one which renders moral action superfluous and in which moral action does not take place at all hence the postulate of the harmony between morality and reality a harmony involved in the very notion of moral action which means bringing the two into agreement finds on this view too an expression which takes the form because moral action is the absolute purpose the absolute purpose is that moral action do not take place at all if we put these moments together through which consciousness has gone on presenting its ideas of its moral life we see that it cancels each one again in its opposite it starts from the position that for it morality and reality do not make a harmony but it is not in earnest with that for in the moral act it is conscious of the presence of this harmony but neither is it in earnest with this action since the action is something particular while it has such a high purpose the highest good this however is once more merely a dissemblance of the actual fact for thereby all action and all morality would fall to the ground in other words it is not strictly in earnest with moral action on the contrary it really feels that what is most to be wished for the absolutely desirable is that the highest good were carried out and moral action superfluous from this result consciousness must go on still further in its contradictory procedure and must of necessity again dissemble the abolition of moral action morality is the inherently essential an sich in order that it may have place the final end of the world cannot be carried out rather the moral consciousness must exist for itself and must find lying before it a nature opposing it but it must per se be completed this leads to the second postulate of the harmony of itself and sensibility the nature immediately within it moral self-consciousness sets up its purpose as pure purpose as independent of inclinations and impulses so that this bare purpose has abolished within itself the ends of sensibility but this cancelling of the element of sense is no sooner set up than it is again dissembled the moral consciousness acts it brings its purpose into reality and self-conscious sensibility which should be done away with is precisely the mediating element between pure consciousness and reality is the instrument used by the former for the realization of itself or is the organ of what is called impulse inclination it is thus not really in earnest in cancelling inclinations and impulses for these are just self-consciousness making itself actual moreover they ought not to be suppressed but merely to be in conformity with reason they are too in conformity with it for moral action is nothing else than self-realizing consciousness consciousness taking on the form of an impulse that is it is immediately the realized actually present harmony of impulse and morality but in point of fact the impulse is not only this empty conscious form which might possibly have within itself a spring of action other than the impulse in question and be driven on by that for sensibility is a kind of nature which contains within itself its own laws and springs of action consequently morality cannot seriously mean to be the inciting motive triebfeder for impulses triebe the angle of inclination for inclinations 
for since these latter have their own fixed character and peculiar content the consciousness to which they were to conform would rather be in conformity with them a conformity which moral self-consciousness declines to adopt the harmony between the two is thus merely implicit and postulated in moral action the realized or present harmony of morality and sensibility was set up at one moment and at the next is displaced the harmony is in a misty distance beyond consciousness where there is nothing more to be accurately distinguished or grasped for to grasp this unity which we have just tried to do has proved impossible in this merely imminent or implicit harmony however consciousness gives up itself altogether this imminent state is its moral completion where the struggle of morality and sensibility has ceased and the latter is in conformity to the former in a way which cannot be made out on that account this completion is again merely a dissemblance of the actual case for in point of fact morality would be really giving up itself in that completion because it is only consciousness of absolute purpose qua pure and simple purpose that is in opposition to all other purposes morality is both the activity of this pure purpose and at the same time the consciousness of rising above sensibility of being mixed up with sensibility and of opposing and struggling with it that this moral completion is not taken seriously is directly expressed by consciousness in the fact that it shifts this completion away into infinity that is asserts that the completion is never completed thus it is really only the middle state of being incomplete that is admitted to having any value a state nevertheless which at least ought to be one of progress towards completion yet it cannot be so for advancing in morality would mean approaching its annihilation and disappearance for the goal would be the nothingness above mentioned the abolition of morality and consciousness itself but to come ever nearer and nearer to nothing means to decrease besides advancing would in general in the same way as decreasing introduce distinctions of quantity into morality but these are quite inadmissible in such a sphere in morality qua mode of consciousness which takes the ethical end to be pure duty we cannot think at all of difference least of all of the superficial difference of quantity there is only one virtue only one pure duty only one morality since then it is not moral completion that is taken seriously but rather the middle state that is as just explained the condition of no morality we thus come by another way back to the content of the first postulate for we cannot perceive how happiness is to be demanded for this moral consciousness on the ground of its worthiness to be happy it is well aware of its not being complete and cannot therefore in point of fact demand happiness as a desert as something of which it is worthy it can ask happiness to be given merely as an act of free grace that is it can only ask for happiness as such and as a substantive element by itself it cannot expect it except as the result of chance and caprice not because there is any absolute reason of the above sort the condition of non-morality herein expresses just what it is that it is concerned not about morality but about happiness alone without reference to morality by this second aspect of the moral point of view the assertion of the first aspect wherein disharmony between morality and happiness is presupposed is also cancelled one may pretend to have found by experience that in the actual present the man who is moral often fares badly while the man who is not often comes off happily yet the middle state of incomplete morality the condition which has proved to be the essential one shows clearly that this perception that morality fares badly this experience which ought to be but is not is merely a dissemblance of the real facts of the case for since morality is not completed that is since morality in point of fact is not what can there be in experience that morality should fare badly since at the same time it has come out that the point at issue concerns happiness alone it is manifest that in making the judgment the man who has no morality comes off well there was no intention to convey thereby that there is something wrong in such a case the designation of an individual as one devoid of morality necessarily falls to the ground when morality in general is incomplete such a characterization rests indeed on pure caprice 
hence the sense and content of that judgment of experience is simply this that happiness as such should not have fallen to some one who got it that is the judgment is an expression of envy which is assuming the covering cloak of morality the reason however why we think good luck as we call it should fall to the lot of others is good friendship which ungrudgingly grants and wishes them and wishes itself too this favour this accident of good fortune morality then in the moral consciousness is not completed this is what is now established but its essence consists in being merely what is complete and so pure morality incomplete morality is therefore impure in other words is immorality morality itself thus exists in another being than the actual concrete consciousness this other is a holy moral legislator morality which is not completed in consciousness the morality which is the reason for making those postulates means in the first instance that morality when it is set up as actual in consciousness stands in relation to something else to an existence and thus itself preserves and implies otherness or distinction whence arises a manifold plurality of moral commands the moral self-consciousness at the same time however looks on these many duties as unessential for it is concerned with merely the one pure duty and this plurality of duties so far as they are determinate duties have no true reality for self-consciousness they can thus have their real truth accepted only in another consciousness and are what they are not for the actual moral self-consciousness sacred through a holy lawgiver but this too is again merely a dissembling of the actual fact for moral self-consciousness is to itself the absolute and duty is simply and solely what it knows to be duty it however recognizes only pure duty as duty what is not sacred in its view is not in itself sacred at all and what is not per se sacred cannot be rendered so by some being that is sacred moral consciousness further is not really serious in allowing something to be made sacred by another consciousness than its own for only that is without qualification sacred in its eyes which is made sacred through its own action and is sacred within it it is thus just as little in earnest in treating this other being as a holy being for this would mean that within it something was to attain an essential significance which for the moral consciousness that is in itself has none if the sacred being was postulated in order that duty might have binding validity within the moral consciousness not qua pure duty but as a plurality of specific duties then this must again be dissembled and the other being must be solely sacred in so far as only pure duty has binding validity within the moral consciousness pure duty has also in point of fact validity and bindingness only in another being not in the moral consciousness although within the latter pure morality seems alone to hold good still this must be put right in another form for it is at the same time a natural consciousness morality is in it affected and conditioned by sensibility and thus is not by itself self-contained but a contingent result of free will in it however qua pure will morality is a contingency of knowledge taken by itself therefore morality is in another being is self-complete only in another reality than the actual moral consciousness this other being then is here absolutely complete morality because in its case morality does not stand in relation to nature and sensibility yet the reality of pure duty lies in its actualization in nature and sensibility the moral consciousness accounts for its incompleteness by the fact that morality in its case has a positive relation to nature and sensibility since it holds an essential moment of morality to be that morality should have simply and solely a negative relation towards nature and sensibility the pure moral being on the other hand because far above the struggle with nature and sense does not stand in a negative relation to them thus in point of fact the positive relation to them alone remains in its case that is there remains just what a moment ago passed for the incomplete for what was not moral pure morality however entirely cut off from actual reality so as likewise to be even without positive relation to reality would be a blank unreal abstraction where the very notion of morality 
which consists in thinking of pure duty and in willing and doing would be absolutely done away with this other being so purely and entirely moral is again therefore a mere dissemblance of the actual fact and has to be given up in this purely moral being however the moments of the contradiction in which this synthetic ideational process is carried on come closer together so likewise do the opposites taken up alternately now this and also that and also the other opposites which are allowed to follow one after the other with one opposite constantly set aside by another yet without these ideas ever being brought together so close do they come that consciousness here has to give up its moral view of the world and retreat within itself it knows its morality as incomplete because it is affected by an opposing sensibility and nature which partly perturb morality as such and partly give rise to a plurality of duties by which in concrete cases of real action consciousness finds itself embarrassed for each case is the concrete focus of many moral relations just as an object of perception in general is a thing with many qualities and since a determinant duty is a purpose it has a content its content is a part of the purpose and so morality is not pure morality this latter then has its real existence in some other being but such reality means nothing else than that morality is here self-complete in itself and for itself for itself that is is morality of consciousness in itself that is has existence and actuality in that first incomplete consciousness morality is not realized and carried out it is there something immanent and implicit in the sense of a mere thought element for it is associated with nature and sensibility with the actuality of external existence and conscious life which constitutes its content and nature and sensibility are morally nothing in the second morality is present as completed and not in the form of an unrealized thought element but this completion consists just in the fact that morality has reality in a consciousness in the sense of free reality objective existence in general is not something empty but filled out full of content that is to say the completion of morality is placed in this that what a moment ago was characterized as morally nothing is found present in morality and inherent in it it is at one time to have validity simply and solely as the unrealized thought element a product of pure abstraction but on the other hand is just as certainly to have in this form no validity at all its true nature is to consist in being opposed to reality detached altogether therefrom and empty and then again to consist in being actual reality the syncretism or fusion of these contradictions which is expressed in extenso in the moral attitude of experience collapses internally since the distinction on which it rests its distinction from something which must be thought and stated as a necessity and is yet at the same time not essential passes into one which does not any longer exist even in words what at the end is affirmed to be something with different aspects both to be nothing and also real is one and the very same existence and reality and what is to be absolute only as something beyond actual existence and actual consciousness and at the same time to be only in consciousness and so qua beyond nothing at all this absolute is pure duty and the knowledge that pure duty is the essentially real the consciousness which makes this distinction that is no distinction which announces actuality to be at once what is nothing and what is real pronounces pure morality to be both the ultimate truth and also to be devoid of all true reality and expresses together in one and the same breath ideas which it formerly separated such a consciousness itself proclaims that it is not in earnest with this characterization and separation of the moments of self and inherent reality it shows on the contrary that what it announces as absolute existence apart from consciousness it really keeps enclosed within the self of self-consciousness and that what it gives out as something entirely in thought or absolutely inherent and implicit it just for that reason takes to be something which has no truth at all it becomes clear to consciousness that placing these moments apart from each other is mentally displacing them 
is a dissemblance and it would be hypocrisy were it really to keep to this but being pure moral self-consciousness it flees from this discordance between what it represents and what constitutes its essential nature flees from this untruth which gives out as true what it holds to be untrue and turning away with abhorrence it hastens back into itself the consciousness which scorns such a moral idea of the world is pure conscience gewissen. it is in its inmost being simply spirit consciously assured or certain gewiss, of itself spirit which acts directly in the light of this assurance which acts conscientiously gewissenhaft without the intervention of those ideas and finds its true nature in this direct immediacy while however this sphere of dissemblance is nothing else than the development of moral self-consciousness in its various moments and is consequently its reality so too this self-consciousness by returning into itself will become in its inmost nature nothing else this returning into itself indeed simply means that it has come to be conscious that its truth is a pretended truth a mere pretense as returning into itself it had to be always giving out this pretended truth as its real truth for it had to express and display itself as an objective idea but it had to know all the same that this is merely a dissemblance it would consequently be in point of fact hypocrisy all the while and its abhorrence of such dissemblance would be itself the first expression of hypocrisy end of section fifteen section sixteen of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter six c subsection c conscience the beautiful soul evil and the forgiveness of it part one the antinomy in the moral view of the world that is that there is a moral consciousness and that there is none or that the validity the bindingness of duty has its ground beyond consciousness and conversely only takes effect in consciousness these contradictory elements had been combined in the idea in which the non-moral consciousness is to pass for moral its contingent knowledge and will to be accepted as fully sufficing and happiness to be its lot as a matter of grace moral self-consciousness took this self-contradictory idea not upon itself but transferred it to another being but this putting outside itself of what it must think as necessary is as much a contradiction in form as the other was in content but that which appears as contradictory and that in the division and again dissolution of which lies the round of activity peculiar to the moral attitude are inherently the same for pure duty qua pure knowledge is nothing else than the self of consciousness and the self of consciousness is existence and actuality and in the same way what is to be beyond actual consciousness is nothing else than pure thought is in fact the self because this is so self-consciousness for us or per se passes back into itself and becomes aware that that being is itself in which the actual is at once pure knowledge and pure duty it takes itself to be absolutely valid in its contingency to be that which knows its immediate particular existence as pure knowledge and action as the true objective reality and harmony this self of conscience the phase of spiritual life immediately certain of itself as absolute truth and objective being is the third type of spiritual self it is the outcome of the third sphere of the spiritual world and may be shortly contrasted with the two former types of self the totality or actuality which is revealed as the final result of the ethical world the world of the social order is the self of a person ethical personality its existence lies in its being recognized and acknowledged as the person is the self devoid of substance its existence is abstract reality too the person has a definite standing and that directly and unconditionally its self is the point in the sphere of its existence which is immediately at rest that point is not torn away from its universality 
the two the particular focus and its universality are therefore not in a relational process with regard to one another the universal is in it without distinction and is neither the content of the self nor is the self filled by itself the second self is the final truth and outcome of a world of culture is spirit that has recovered itself after and through disruption is absolute freedom in this self the former immediate unity of individual existence and universality finds its elements separated from one another the universal which remains at the same time a purely spiritual entity the state of recognition or universal will and universal knowledge the universal is object and content of the self and its universal actuality but the universal has not there the form of existence detached from the self in this mode of self it therefore gets no filling no positive content no world moral self-consciousness indeed lets its universal aspect get detached so that this aspect becomes a nature of its own and at the same time it retains this universality within itself in a superseded form but it is merely a game of dissembling it constantly interchanges these two characteristics in the form of conscience with its certainty of itself it first finds the content to fill the former emptiness of duty as well as the emptiness of right and the empty universal will and because this certainty of self is at the same time immediacy it finds in conscience definite existence having reached this level of its truth moral self-consciousness then leaves or rather supersedes this state of internal division and self-separation whence arose dissimulation the separation of its inherent being from the self of pure duty qua pure purpose from reality qua a nature and a sensibility opposed to mere purpose it is when thus returned into itself concrete moral spirit which does not make for itself a bare abstract standard out of the consciousness of pure duty a standard to be set up against actual conscious life on the contrary pure duty as also the sensuous nature opposed to pure duty are superseded moments this mode of spirit in its immediate unity is a moral being making itself actual and an act is immediately a concrete embodiment of morality given a case of action it is an objective reality for the knowing mind the latter qua conscience knows it in a direct concrete manner and at the same time it is merely as conscience knows it to be when knowledge is something other than its object it is contingent in character spirit however which is sure of itself is not at all an accidental knowledge of that kind is not a way of producing inside its own being ideas from which reality is divorced on the contrary since the separation between what is essential or inherent and self has been given up a case of moral action falls just as it is per se directly within immediate conscious certainty the sensible feeling form of knowledge and it merely is per se as it is in this form of knowledge action then qua realization is in this way the pure form of will the bare conversion of reality in the sense of a given case into a reality that is performed and done the conversion of the bare state of objective knowledge into one of knowledge about reality as something produced and brought about by consciousness just as sensuous certainty is directly taken up or rather converted into the essential life and substance of spirit this other transformation is also simple and unmediated a transition made through pure conception without changing the content the content being conditioned by some interest on the part of the consciousness knowing it further conscience does not break up the circumstances of the case into a variety of duties it does not operate as the positive general medium in which the manifold duties each for itself would keep their substantial existence undisturbed if it did so either no action could take place at all because of each concrete case in general containing opposition and in the specific case of morality opposition of duties and hence there would always be one side injured one duty violated when the act took definite shape or else if action did take place the violation of one of the conflicting duties would be the actual result brought about 
conscience is rather the negative single unity it is the absolute self which does away with this variety of substantial moral constituents it is simple action in accordance with duty action which does not fulfil this or that duty but knows and does what is concretely right it is therefore in general and for the first time in moral experience moral action as action and into this the previous stage of mere consciousness of morality without action has passed the concrete shape which the act takes may be analysed by a conscious process of distinction into a variety of properties that is in this case into a variety of moral relationships and these may either be each expressly held to be absolute as each must be if it is to be duty or again subjected to comparison and criticism in the simple moral action arising from conscience duties are shed so promiscuously that the isolated independence of all these separate entities is immediately destroyed and the process of critically considering and worrying about what our duty is finds no place at all in the unshaken certainty of conscience just as little again do we find in conscience that fluctuating uncertainty of mind which puts now so-called pure morality away from itself assigning it to some other holy being and takes itself to be unholy and then again on the other hand puts this moral purity within itself and places in that other the connection of the sensuous with the moral element it renounces all these semblances and dissemblances stellungen and verstellungen characteristic of the moral point of view when it gives up thinking that there is a contradiction between duty and actual reality according to this latter state of mind i act morally when i am conscious of performing merely pure duty and nothing else but that that is in fact when i do not act when however i really act i am conscious of an other of a reality which is there before me and one which i want to bring about i have a definite end and fulfil a definite duty there is something else therein than the pure duty which alone was supposed to be kept in view conscience on the other hand is the sense that when the moral consciousness declares pure duty to be the essence of its action this bare purpose is a dissemblance of the actual fact for the real fact is that bare duty consists in the empty abstraction of pure thought and finds its reality and content solely in some definite actual existence an actuality which is actuality of consciousness itself not of consciousness in the sense of a thought entity but as an individual conscience for its own part finds its truth to lie in the direct certainty regarding itself this immediate concrete certainty of itself is true reality looking at this certainty from the point of view of the opposition which consciousness involves its own immediate particularity constitutes the content of moral action and the form of moral action is just this very self as a pure process that is as the process of knowing in other words is private individual conviction looking more closely at the unity and the significance of the moments of this stage we find that moral consciousness conceived itself merely in the form of the inherent principle or as ultimate essence qua conscience however it lays hold of its explicit individual self-existence für sich sein or itself the contradiction involved in the moral point of view is resolved that is the distinction which lay at the basis of its peculiar attitude proves to be no distinction and melts into the process of pure negativity this process of negativity is however just the self a single simple self which is at once pure knowledge and knowledge of itself as this individual conscious life this self constitutes therefore the content of what formerly was the empty essence for it is something actual and concrete which no longer has the significance of being a nature alien to the ultimate essence a nature independent and with laws of its own as the negative element it introduces distinction into the pure essence a definite content and one too which has a value in its own right as it stands further this self is qua pure self-identical knowledge the universal without qualification so that just this knowledge being its very own knowledge being conviction constitutes duty 
duty is no longer the universal appearing over against and opposed to the self duty is known to have in this condition of separation and opposition no validity it is now the law which exists for the sake of the self and not the self for the sake of the law the law and duty however have for that reason not only the significance of existing on their own account but also of being inherent and essential for this knowledge is in virtue of its identity with itself just what is inherently essential this inherent being gets also separated in consciousness from that direct and immediate unity with self-existence so contrasted and opposed it is objective being it is being for something else duty itself now qua duty deserted by the self is known and thought to be merely a moment it has ceased to mean absolute being it has become degraded to something which is not a self does not exist on its own account and is thus what exists for something else but this existing for something else remains just for that reason an essential moment because self qua consciousness constitutes and establishes the opposition between existence for self and existence for another and now duty essentially means something immediately actual and is no longer a mere abstract consciousness of duty this existence for something else is then the inherently essential substance distinguished from the self conscience has not given up pure duty the abstract implicit essence pure duty is the essential moment of relating itself qua universality to others conscience is the common element of distinct self-consciousness and this is the substance in which the act secures subsistence and reality the moment enabling recognition by others to take place the moral self-consciousness does not possess this moment of recognition of pure consciousness which has definite existence and on that account really does not act at all does not effectually actualize anything its inherent nature is for it either the abstract unreal essence or else existence in the form of a reality which has no spiritual character the actual reality of conscience however is one which is itself that is an existence conscious of itself the spiritual element of being recognized doing something is therefore merely the translation of its particular content into that objective element where it is universal and is recognized and this very fact that the content is recognized makes the deed an actuality the action is recognized and thereby real because the actual reality is immediately bound up with conviction or knowledge or in other words knowledge of its purpose is immediately and at once the element of existence universal recognition for the essence of the act duty consists in the conviction conscience has about it this conviction is just the inherent principle itself it is inherently universal self-consciousness in other words is recognition and hence reality the result achieved under conviction of duty is therefore directly one which has substantial solid existence thus we hear nothing more there about good intention not coming to anything definite or about the good man faring badly what is known as duty is carried out completely and becomes an actual fact just because what is dutiful is the universal for all self-consciousnesses that which is recognized acknowledged and thus objectively is taken separately and alone however without the content of self this duty is existence for another the transparent element which has merely the significance of an unsubstantial ultimate factor in general if we look back on the sphere where in general spiritual reality made its appearance we find that the principle involved was that the utterance of individuality is the absolutely real the ultimately self-sufficing but the shape which in the first instance gave expression to this notion was the honest consciousness which was occupied and concerned with abstract fact itself this fact itself was there a predicate in conscience however it is for the first time a subject which has put all aspects of consciousness in it and for which all these moments substantiality in general external existence and essence of thought are contained in this certainty of itself the fact itself has substantiality in general in the ethical order external existence in culture 
self-knowing essence of thought in morality and in conscience it is the subject which knows these moments within itself while the honest consciousness is for ever grasping merely the bare and empty fact itself conscience on the other hand secures the fact itself in its fullness a fullness which conscience of itself supplies conscience has this power through its knowing the moments of consciousness as moments and controlling them because it is their negative essential principle when conscience is considered in relation to the particular features of the opposition which appears in action and when we consider its consciousness regarding the nature of those features its attitude towards the reality of the particular case where action takes effect is in the first instance that of knowledge so far as the aspect of universality is present in such knowledge it is the business of conscientious action qua knowledge to compass the reality before it in an unrestricted exhaustive manner and thus get to know exactly the circumstances of the case and give them due consideration this knowledge however since it is aware of universality as a moment is in consequence a kind of knowledge of these circumstances which is conscious all the while of not embracing them is conscious of not being conscientious in its procedure the genuinely universal and pure relation of knowledge would be one towards something not opposed a relation to itself but action through the opposition essentially implied in action is related to what negates consciousness to a reality existing per se contrasted with the simple nature of pure consciousness the absolute other externality multiplicity per se is a sheer plurality of circumstances which breaks up indefinitely and spreads in all directions backwards in their conditions sidewards in their associations forwards in their consequences the conscientious mind is aware of this state of affairs and of its relation thereto and knows it is not acquainted to the full and complete extent required with the case in which its action takes effect and knows that its pretense of conscientiously weighing and considering all the circumstances is futile this acquaintance with and consideration of all the circumstances however are not entirely absent but they are merely present as a moment as something which is only for others and the conscientious mind holds its incomplete knowledge to be sufficient and complete merely because it is its own knowledge in a similar way is constituted the process in connection with the universality of the essential principle the universality by which the content is characterized when determined through pure consciousness conscience when it goes on to act takes up a relation to the various sides of the case the case breaks up into separate elements and the relation of pure consciousness towards it does the same whereby the multiplicity characteristic of the case becomes a multiplicity of duties conscience knows that it has to select and decide amongst them for none of them specifically in its content is an absolute duty only duty pure and simple is so but this abstract entity has in its realization come to denote self-conscious ego spirit certain of itself is at rest within itself in the form of conscience and its real universality its duty lies in its bare conviction concerning duty this bare conviction as such is as empty as pure duty pure in the sense that nothing within it no definite content is duty action however has to take place the individual must determine to do something or other and spirit which is certain of itself in which the inherent principle has attained the significance of self-conscious ego knows it has this determination this specific content within the immediate certainty of its own self this certainty being a determination and a content is natural consciousness that is the various impulses and inclinations conscience admits no content as absolute for it because it is absolute negativity of all that is definite it determines from itself alone the circle of the self however within which determinateness as such falls is so-called sensibility in order to get a content out of the immediate certainty of self there is no means to be found except sensibility everything that in previous modes of experience was presented as good or bad law and right is something other than immediate certainty of self it is a universal which is now a relative entity an existence for another 
or looked at otherwise it is an object which while connecting and relating consciousness with itself comes between consciousness and its own proper truth and instead of that object being the immediacy of consciousness it rather cuts consciousness off from itself for conscience however certainty of self is the pure direct and immediate truth and this truth is thus its immediate certainty of self presented as content that is its truth is altogether the caprice of the individual and the accidental content of his unconscious natural existence his sensibility this content at the same time passes for essential moral reality for duty for pure duty as was found when testing and examining laws is utterly indifferent to every content and gets along with any here it has at the same time the essential form of self-existence of existing on its own account and this form of individual conviction is nothing else than the sense of the emptiness of pure duty and the consciousness that this is merely a moment that its substantial independence is a predicate which finds its subjects in the individual whose caprice gives pure duty content can connect every content with this form and attach its feeling of conscientiousness to any content an individual increases his property in a certain way it is a duty that each should see to the maintenance of himself and family and no less ensure the possibility of his being serviceable to his neighbours and of doing good to those standing in need the individual is aware that this is a duty for this content is directly contained in the certainty he has of himself he perceives further that he fulfils this particular duty in this particular case other people possibly consider the specific way he adopts as fraud they hold by other sides of the concrete case presented while he holds firmly to this particular side of it by the fact of his being conscious that the increase of property is a pure and absolute duty in the same way there is fulfilled by the individual as a duty what other people call violence and wrongdoing the duty of asserting one's independence against others and again the duty of preserving one's life and maintaining the possibility of being useful to one's neighbours others call this cowardice but what they call courage really violates both these duties but what they call courage really violates both these duties but cowardice cannot be so stupid and thoughtless as not to know that the maintenance of life and the possibility of being useful to others are duties so inept as not to be convinced of the dutifulness of its action and not to know that dutifulness consists in knowledge otherwise it would commit the absurdity of being without morality since morality lies in the consciousness of having fulfilled one's duty this will not be lacking when the action is what is called cowardice any more than when it is what is called courage as the abstraction called duty is capable of every content it is quite equal to this latter content the agent acting knows what he does to be duty and since he knows this and conviction as to duty is just dutifulness he is thus recognized and acknowledged by others the act thereby becomes accepted as valid and has actual existence it is of no avail to object to this freedom which puts one kind of content as well as any other into this universal inert receptacle of pure duty and pure knowledge by asserting that another content ought to have been put there for whatever the content be each content has upon it the stain of determinateness from which pure knowledge is free which pure knowledge can disregard just as readily as it can take up every determinateness in turn every content through its being determinate stands on the same footing with every other even though it seems to have precisely the character that the particularity in the content is cancelled it may well seem since in concrete cases duty breaks regularly into opposition and by doing so sunders the opposite's particularity and universality that the duty whose content is the universal as such contains on that account ipso facto the nature of pure duty and that thus form and content are here entirely in accord on this view it might seem that for example acting for the universal good for what is the best for all is to be preferred to acting for what is the best for the individual 
but this universal duty is in its entirety what is present as self-contained actual substance in the form of established law and right and holds good independently of the individual's knowledge and conviction and immediate interest it is thus precisely that against the form of which morality as a whole is directed as regards its content however even this is determinate in character in so far as the universally best is opposed to the individual best consequently its law is one from which conscience knows itself to be absolutely free and it gives itself the absolute privilege to add and pair to neglect as well as fulfil it then again the above distinction of duty towards the individual and duty towards the universal is not something fixed and final when we look at the nature of the opposition in question on the contrary what the individual does for himself is to the advantage of the universal as well the more he looks after his own good not only is there a greater possibility of his usefulness to others his very reality consists merely in his living and existing in connection with others his individual enjoyment means ultimately and essentially putting what is his own at the disposal of others and helping them to secure their enjoyment in fulfilling duty to individuals and hence duty to self duty to the general thus also gets fulfilled weighing considering comparing duties should disappear here would take the line of calculating the advantage which the general would get from any given action but there can be no such process partly because morality would thereby be handed over to the inevitable contingency characteristic of mere insight partly because it is precisely the nature of conscience to have done with all this calculating and weighing of duties and to decide directly from itself without reasons of any kind in this way then conscience acts and maintains itself in the unity of its essential being and its objective existence for itself in the unity of pure thought and individuality it is spirit certain of itself which inherently possesses its own truth within itself in its knowledge a knowledge in the sense of knowledge of its duty it maintains its being therein by the fact that the positive element in the act the content as well as form of duty and the knowledge of duty belong to the self to the certainty of itself what however seeks to come before the self with an inherent being of its own is held to be not truly real merely a transcendent element only a moment consequently it is not universal knowledge in general that has a value but what is known of the circumstances it puts into duty which is the universal immanent essence the content which it derives from its natural individuality for the content is one that is present in its own being this content in virtue of the universal medium wherein it exists becomes the duty which it carries out and empty bare duty is through this very fact affirmed to be something transcended a moment this content is its emptiness transcended and cancelled that is is the fulfilling of pure duty but at the same time conscience is detached from every possible content it absolves itself from every specific duty which would try to pass for a law in the strength of its certainty of itself it has the majesty of absolute self-sufficiency of absolute autarchia to bind or to lose this self-determination is at once therefore absolute conformity to duty duty is the knowledge itself this pure and simple selfhood however is the immanent principle and essence for this inherent principle is pure self-identity and self-identity lies in this consciousness this pure knowledge is immediately objective is existence for another for qua pure self-identity it is immediacy it is objective being this being however is at the same time pure universality the selfhood of all in other words action is acknowledged and hence actual this being forms the element by which conscience directly stands on a footing of equality with every self-consciousness and this relation means not an abstract impersonal law but the self of conscience in that this right which conscience does is at the same time however a fact for others a disparity seems to affect conscience the duty which it fulfils is a determinate content 
that content is no doubt the self of consciousness and so its knowledge of itself its identity with itself but when fulfilled when planted in the general element of existence this identity is no longer knowledge no longer this process of distinction which directly and at the same time does away with its distinctions rather in the sphere of existence distinction is set up as subsistent and the act is a determinate specific one not identical with the element of everybody's self-consciousness and hence not necessarily acknowledged and recognized both aspects conscience qua acting and the general consciousness acknowledging this act to be duty stand equally loose from the specific character belonging to this deed on account of this freedom and detachment the relation of the two within the common medium of their connection is rather a relationship of complete disparity as a result of which the consciousness doing and owning the act finds itself in complete uncertainty regarding the spirit which does the act and is certain of itself this spirit acts and places in existence a particular determinate characteristic others hold to this existence as its truth and are therein certain of this spirit it has therein expressed what it takes to be its duty but it is detached and free from any specific duty it has therefore left the point where other people think it actually to be and this very medium of existence and duty as inherently existing are held by it to be merely transitory moments what it does places before them it also displaces again or rather has eo ipso immediately displaced for its reality is for it not the duty and determinate content thus put forward but rather is the reality which it has in its absolute certainty of itself the other self-consciousnesses do not know then whether this particular conscience is morally good or is wicked or rather not merely can they not know this conscience but they must take it to be also wicked for just as it stands loose to the determinate content of duty and detached from duty as inherently existing so they do likewise what is placed before them they themselves know how to displace or dissemble it is something expressing merely the self of another individual not their own they do not merely know themselves to be detached and free from it but have to resolve and dissipate it within their own consciousness reduce it to nothingness by judgments and explanations in order to preserve their own self but the act of conscience is not merely this determination of existence a determinate content forsaken by the pure self what ought to be binding as duty and get recognized as such only is so through knowledge and conviction as to its being duty by knowledge of self in the deed done when the deed ceases to have in it this element of self it ceases to be what is alone its essential nature its existence if deserted by this consciousness of self would be an ordinary reality and the act would appear to us a way of fulfilling one's pleasure and desire what ought to exist has here essentiality only by its being known to be individuality giving itself expression and its being thus known is the fact acknowledged and recognized by others and is that which as such ought to have existence the self enters existence as self the spirit which is certain of itself exists as such for others its immediate act is not what is accepted and real what is acknowledged by others is not the determinate element not the inherent being but solely and simply the self knowing itself as such the element which gives permanence and stability is universal self-consciousness what enters this element cannot be the effect of the act the latter does not last there and maintains no permanence only self-consciousness is what is recognized and gains concrete reality here again then we see language to be the form in which spirit finds existence language is the way self-consciousness exists for others it is self-consciousness which is there immediately present as such and in the form of this actual universal self-consciousness language is self separating itself from itself which comes objectively before itself as the pure ego identical with ego which at once maintains itself in this objective form as this actual self 
and at the same time fuses directly with others and is their self-consciousness the self perceives itself at the same time that it is perceived by others and this perceiving is just existence which has become a self the content which language has here obtained is no longer the self we found in the world of culture perverted perverting and distraught it is spirit which having returned to itself is certain of itself certain in itself of its truth of its own act of recognition and of being recognized as this knowledge the language of the ethical spirit of society is law and simple command and complaint which is but a tear shed over necessity moral consciousness on the other hand remains dumb shut up within its inner life for self has no existence as yet in its case rather existence and self there stand in the first instance in external relation to each other language however comes forward merely as the mediating element between independent self-consciousnesses recognized and acknowledged and the existent self means immediately universal recognition means recognition in manifold ways and in this very manifoldness simple recognition what the language of conscience contains is the self knowing itself as essential reality this alone is what that language expresses and this expression is the true realization of doing anything and renders the act valid and acceptable consciousness expresses its conviction in this conviction alone is the action duty it holds good as duty too solely by the conviction being expressed for universal self-consciousness stands detached from the specific act which merely exists the act qua existence means nothing to it what it holds of importance is the conviction that the act is a duty and this appears concretely in language to realize the act means here not translating its content from the form of purpose or subjectivity into the form of abstract reality it means translating it from the form of immediate certainty of self which takes its knowledge its self-existence to be the essential fact into the form of the assurance that consciousness is convinced of its duty and being conscious knows of itself what duty is this assurance thus guarantees that it is convinced of its conviction being the essential fact whether the assurance that it acts from conviction of duty is true whether that really is duty which is done these questions or doubts have no meaning if directed against conscience in the case of the question whether the assurance is true it would be assumed that the inner intention is different from the one put forward that is that the willing of a particular self can be separated from duty from the will of the universal and pure consciousness the latter will would in that case be a matter of words while the former would be strictly the real moving principle of the act but such a distinction between the universal consciousness and the particular self is precisely what has been cancelled and the superseding of it constitutes conscience immediate knowledge on the part of self which is certain of itself is law and duty its intention by being its own intention is what is right all that is required is that it should know this and state its conviction that its knowledge and will are the right the expression of this assurance ipso facto cancels the form of its particularity it recognizes thereby the necessary universality of the self in that it calls itself conscience it calls itself pure self-knowledge and pure abstract will that is it calls itself a universal knowledge and will which acknowledges and recognizes others is like them for they are just this pure self-knowledge and will and which is on that account also recognized by them in the willing of the self which is certain of itself in this knowledge of the self as the essential reality lies the essence of the right when any one says therefore he is acting from conscience he is saying what is true for his conscience is the self which knows and wills he must however necessarily say so for this self has to be at the same time universal self it is not universal in the content of the act for this content is per se indifferent on account of its being specific and determinate the universality lies in the form of the act it is this form which is to be affirmed as real 
the form is the self which as such is actual in language pronounces itself to be the truth and just by so doing acknowledges all other selves and is recognized by them end of section sixteen